Did you know that for the longest time there was only one Korea? And that the split between North Korea and South Korea only happened 70 years ago? So what caused the division between North Korea and South Korea? Well, in 1910, Japan invaded Korea for 35 years. And during this time, the Koreans struggled to preserve their culture because no Korean was to be taught in school and all documents pertaining to Korean history had to be burnt down. Everyone needed to have a Japanese name and everyone needed to speak Japanese. All the farmings that the Koreans did was to better Japan. Also, as a side note, this whole thing was occurring during World War II and there were two major teams against each other. Team Axis, which consisted of Germany, Italy, and Japan. And Team The Big Three, which is US, the Soviet Union, and the Great Britain. Back to Korea. In 1945, the Soviet Union was advancing in Korea and was crushing the Japanese army. And it seemed like the Japan was going to surrender soon because so many of their people had died. Now even though the Soviet Union and the US were in the same team technically, they had different political views and were suspicious of each other. The US did not have a base in Korea and feared that the Soviet Union would fully take over Korea once the Japanese surrenders. So, in order to prevent the Soviet Union from taking full control of Korea, the U.S. suggested a temporary division of Korea. The Soviet Union will occupy North Korea, and the U.S. will occupy South Korea. This was only a temporary arrangement, and Korea was to be brought back together after all the administration stuff was to be sorted out. So then, it finally happened. In September 1945, Japan surrendered and lost World War II, and just as they planned, the Soviet Union occupied North Korea and the U.S. occupied South Korea. As mentioned before, the U.S. and the Soviet Union were on the same team for World War II. However, they had very different political ideologies, which also influenced the people of Korea. The Soviet Union promoted communism in North Korea, and the U.S. promoted capitalism in South Korea. And so then, the people from the two different parts of Korea began to have very different political views. In 1947, the UN oversee an election in North Korea and South Korea, and the goal was to form one democratic government. However, there was a lack of trust between both sides of Korea, and this election was not successful. Also, as part of the UN agreement, eventually, the armies from both Soviet Union and the US withdrew from Korea. However, the two parts of Korea remained really tense. Both North Korea and South Korea wanted to be united. However, their political views were way too different. In 1950, however, North Korea went ahead and attacked South Korea in order to bring both Koreas under the communist rule. The Soviet Union backed North Korea, and then the US came and backed South Korea. Things got complicated when China backed North Korea, and this became the Korean War which lasted three years and resulted in over two, mil which resulted in over two million people dying. Finally, in 1953, the Armistice Agreement was signed. This agreement was to end all hostilities between the two Koreas against each other. The Armistice Agreement gave birth to the Demilitarized Zone, known as the DMZ. An important thing to know is that the line which divides North Korea and South Korea is called the Military Demarcation Line, MDL. So this is the demarcation line. As part of the Armistice Agreement, both Koreas withdrew 2 kilometers each from the demarcation line. Both Koreas agreed that in this 4 kilometers wide strip of land, there would be no weapons, no shooting. It would be considered a buffer zone. This 4 kilometers wide strip of land became known as the DMZ, Demilitarized Zone. So now we're going to do a breakdown of how the DMZ tour went down. We booked a tour with a company called I Love Soul Tour Guide and it was 115 New Zealand dollars per person. First, we woke up at 6am because we're gonna be picked up at 6.30 and the whole ride lasted about 40 minutes and so only 6 of us on the ride. We are from different countries, some from Spain, some from US and the tour guide was a Korean lady who was very good in English and able to explain about the history of the DMZ to us. The tour guide gave off very protective auntie vibes which you need when going on a tour like this. So we finally arrive at 7.10am and I was so surprised to find out that this is not when the tour begins. No sir, this is when waiting for the ticket shop to buy a ticket for the tour begins. As mentioned earlier, the shuttle picked us up at 6.30am but the actual ticket shop opens at 8.30am. So we had to wake up early 
get up into the front of the line to make sure that when the ticket shop opens, we would be able to secure ourselves a ticket because there were only a limited tickets for a DMZ tour. And during a time, we were able to get our breakfast outside. And so we went out and tried a very cheesy hot dog and some amazing foods. We can say that it's one of the best breakfasts that we ever eaten. And so we bought the ticket and the tour began. The first place we went to is Imjingak Park, which was built in 1972 and holds many statues regarding the Korean War. And in there, you will see the colorful prayer ribbons. The message and the prayer that are written by the South Koreans to their family in North Korea. We can also saw the peace train there, which is the last train to cross the border between South Korea and North Korea. This train was originally supposed to bring supplies to the UN in 1950. However, it got stuck in Hanpo Station in North Korea due to Chinese troops ahead, and the conductor tried to turn the train back to South Korea. However, it was stopped by the US troops who ordered them to destroy the train because it was better to have the train destroyed than have it fall into North Korean hands. Also in there, you will see the Freedom of Bridge. That's a bridge where the South Korean returned from the North Korea after the MST's agreement was signed so that they can be reunited to their family once again. Next stop is the third tunnel of aggression, which is a tunnel that the North Koreans built in order to do a surprise attack on the South Koreans. When it was discovered, the North Koreans made an excuse that they were just trying to mine for coal. But this doesn't make any sense because coal had never been found in that area before. As for our experience of the third tunnel of aggression, we weren't allowed to film it, but let me just quickly describe it to you. We put on a helmet and we went on a ride that was like a roller coaster. The roller coaster was going down a steep downhill area. And the tunnel is quite close to your skin, quite close to your shoulders, quite close to your head, and really quite tight in there. It's not recommended for people who are afraid of enclosed spaces. We rode the ride in the tunnel for a few minutes. And once we got in there, we were able to step out of the tunnel and continue walking. And as you walked, uh, some of the water kind of like dripped on you. And after a bit of walking, we were able to arrive at a zone where there was a hole. And once you peeked through the hole, you'd be looking at North Korean territory. And they were discovered in 1978. It's located 44 kilometers from Seoul. We have a 1,673 meters long. I have the width and the height of two meters and can fit for 30,000 soldiers in the tunnel. The next place is the Dora Observatory. The telescopes are so small that you could see North Korea with your own eyes. We were able to see Ki Jong Dong Propaganda Village. Why is it called a propaganda village? Well, that's because North Korea says that this village is inhabited by a 200 collective families. It has a childcare center, um, primary schools, a hospital, however, South Korea says that it's an empty village, it's all made up and it's just a propaganda to encourage South Koreans to defect and go to North Korea. What do we think? Well, when I had a look through my own telescope, I saw absolutely no one. I did not see a single person walking around in that village. The last part of the tour is the JSA, Joint Security Area. Unfortunately, because of COVID, we weren't able to visit this. However, we did some research in order to know what it was about. So JSA is the only part of the DMZ where North Korea and South Korea meet. And that is the closest point that you can get to North Korea from South Korea without getting arrested or shot. And there in the tour, you are bring into Freedom House. It's the only part of the DMZ where the North and South Korean soldiers are face to face, stay with each other for all day long, and that has already happened for several years. And also, you will bring into the conference room where the MSD's agreements were signed. Well, that's it from us. Hope you enjoy our uh, talk about the tour and about the history of South Korea and North Korea. Till next time, bye! Bye!